You're listening to audio from the Decidedly Podcast. For more information, find us on Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. Certain people are just built for ideas and certain people are built for systems, right? What do you mean? You so mean? you you when you have roles within your company that you need to be manned by someone who loves organization and systems, you know that type of person. Yeah, right. The type of person who is by the book, rule follower, they're going to they're going to create something that works that has hard lines and they're going to present that to everybody else and those people are you know, the, the yeah, there, there are definitely people who are more embracing of systems and there are people who, who are not so good at it. For so sure. it, it's Dory, a woman who works on our team. She yeah. is like amazing at identifying these people, right? She, she can pick out a lot of different types of people, but she can pick out the people who really love to live by the systems, partly because she's one of those people. I'm working on a writing project and I have an editor her name is Melanie. She does a fantastic job. She helps keep me in check, keep me in line. She's very much a systems woman. And I, you can, I can just tell. You can tell by the way she carries herself, by the way she speaks very properly. You can tell by the way she dresses. You know, she is buttoned up. Her hair's never messy. You know, she's, she's never wearing like big flashy, bright colors. She's wearing very muted tones. <laughs> I had written this passage about kind of this ethereal idea about behavioral change. And it was kind of the psychology of behavioral change. And it was, you know, it was kind of flowery hippie type, you know, very (laughs) cerebral, very cerebral. At the end, I quoted, and and we're talking about impact also, right? So then I quoted James Clear in his Atomic Habits, where he talks about, hey, you know, create, uh, focus on uh, systems legacy not an outcome legacy, right? And my point with that was like, you know, think of the most beautiful, biggest impact you could, you can think of, and then commit yourself to actually making it happen on a day-to-day basis. And then the legacy becomes the things that you did day-to-day, not this like huge insurmountable goal that you may or may not even achieve. And so she's, she's like, she writes her comments in what I've written, right? And as I'm reading the passage, it's super negative. She's like, Mm, not really feeling it, not really getting it. <laughs> nah, I don't know if you're quite, I don't really understand the point that you're trying to make here. And then she gets to this part about systems legacy legacy, and she goes, Ooh, I love systems thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was like laughing to myself because I'm thinking to my, I'm thinking as I'm reading her comments, of course you do, Melanie. Of course, of course you love systems. I knew that about you already. You didn't have to tell me. Um, but those people who love systems, we need them. We need them in our life to help people who, like me, are not exactly uh, skilled or talented in creating systems. Um, they they have a lot to share. and There's a lot that we can learn, even those of us who are not inclined to create and operate within systems. So today we talked to Susie Salinas, who is an expert in creating systems. She's the owner of Systems by Susie, a business that helps busy people develop long-term, easy-to-maintain solutions to keep their home, work, lives, and children organized and stress-free. She spent her early career as a teacher and event planner. Three years ago, she turned her love of organizing and helping others into a thriving home organization business. Susie's goal is to help busy adults develop thriving systems to eliminate decision fatigue that comes with physical and mental clutter. She scaled her business from one a one-woman show to a 16-person team during COVID pandemic. We talked about deciding once so you don't get stuck in a rut of endless, de- endless decisions, unsubscribing from the things that clutter your life and brain, brain dumping to decrease the mental load, and making your systems visible and accessible so you can remember what's important. I learned a lot from our conversation with Susie and I was uh, jazzed and inspired to systematize my home life and my business life. So stick around. You're going to learn some helpful tips from Susie. I know I did. I'm Sanger Smith. As always, I'm with my dad, Sean Smith, and this 
is decidedly. Susie! Hello, how are you? I am I am great and I am so excited to have you here. Um, Thanks I'm for having hoping, me. I've enjoyed your podcast. Well, thanks. I enjoy um, your organizational tips, and I'm I'm secretly hoping that you will defend me in my my system of simply throwing everything away. <laughs> hey, that's the less stuff you have, the less you have to organize, right? Oh, you're you're ruthless about that. I've seen you throw <laughs> you just chunk stuff. We were hurt. Are you watch. the opposite, Sean? I think I've been accused of that. Yeah, I've been accused of. Not, I'm not a hoarder, but you yeah, know, I'm not. I'm not as, as well ruthless be. as as, as Sanger. We notice generationally if if when you know if your parent holds on to everything, then the child gets rid of everything, and then their child holds on to everything. It's like a cycle. Mm. Um, oh, is that right? Mm. Does it go back and forth like that? Yeah, it really goes down to a lot of how you were raised and your you know, your views about money and stuff. And I mean, your parents' oh, emotional attachment. It's really interesting. I remember because when, when I grew up, we moved about once a year. And so we didn't have a lot of things. You know, when you move, you just get rid of stuff. Yeah. And so there weren't a lot of things that my parents had that, you know, were super important to them. And so maybe that maybe that was what happened. <laughs> Just latched on to stuff. That's right. You're probably a little more <laughs> sentimental because you wish you had yeah, some maybe. of those memories. Yeah. Maybe that's it. So that's what were you like? Uh, what was it like for you as a kid, Susie? Were you, were you in a family of throw things away or a family of hoarders like Sean? <laughs> um, I would say probably more keepers still my, uh, my, yeah, my parents are more of the keeper side of things, but I, I mean, I was always even for, I remember having, um, like the highlight of my uh, back to school shopping was getting a new planner in like middle school. <laughs> like I really loved planners and organization and all different color highlighters. And like, I was, I was pretty organized as as a kid, not that I didn't have messy rooms and messy spaces, but there were some things in my life I really liked in order and that was important to me. And that's still kind of how I am today. I don't, not everything in my house is perfect all the time, but I like having a place for everything so that you can put it back and get mm. order back quickly. You know, um, I can't live in chaos for too long. How did you decide that this was something you were good enough at that you were going to focus on helping others? That's a good question because I had never even heard of a professional organizer. And there's a lot of people out there who still never have. It's getting to be more common. But um, I was always just having systems set up in my home and um, was fairly organized. And I remember friends coming over for play dates and like, do you run a preschool here? Because everything would be in bins and picture labels on the toy bins and things like that. Um, but I just liked having that kind of order. And so I actually started looking for a solution for my kids' keepsakes that were coming home once when my oldest had started kindergarten. There were so many papers coming home every day. So I created this school memory box and I invited a group of um, ladies that I knew over to my house as like a mini shark tank to see like, would you be interested in buying this? Could I start making these boxes to sell? And they liked the idea of the boxes, but what interested them more was just walking around my house and seeing the chore system I had set up and how I had things organized in my pantry and in just those. And so it was um, someone asked me to help them get um, a space in their home organized. And then it turned into kind of organizing their whole house and them telling their friends. And so I very organically started my own business. It wasn't really until COVID hit that I really started scaling my business. And now we have a team of 16 that are in homes every day and businesses helping people get organized and set up systems. That's a, a tremendous job of scaling in, in a short period. So you were the the local super mom who had, had <laughs> figured out that. how to not have a chaotic <laughs> living room. 
I wouldn't and, say that. I we, you know, we're all doing the best we can, right? Okay, yeah, you're being a little bit humble. I, I've been to the houses that you're talking about that are um, the opposite of yours that look like a bomb went off, and uh, sometimes that was the house that I grew up in, and sometimes, um, you know, I don't have kids, and sometimes that's my house today. <laughs> so it, it, I think everybody everybody wa- wants to be more organized. What were you finding was the cause of people who are not organized? Yeah, well, sometimes there's things like um, ADHD. You know, if people have something else going on, it's really hard because they lose focus and um, they might get really into organizing and then they drop it kind of midstream. And, you know, I think a lot of times we find that um, transitions can cause disarray if you move, if you start a new job, if you have children, if your kids are starting school, like any kind of life transition also can throw you off track, even if you've had good systems in the past and have been organized. And so a lot of times with individuals like that, we just need to give them a fresh start and go in and have them intentionally look at everything they have, make decisions, and then set them up with systems for this new season of their life, especially when people have kids, like they're getting a lot of new stuff that they didn't have before. And so there's not a home for it. There's not a place for it. And that's generally when we see clutter build up is we call clutter delayed decisions. And if you don't know where to put something, you just put it down. If you have a home for everything, then you would just put it away. And so that's our job where we help people is giving everything a home so that not only you know where it is, but anyone else coming into your home could easily find it. Because sometimes people say they're organized, but they're the only one who know where things are. So (laughs) what we try and do is create systems and organization, add labels and make it in an intuitive, obvious space that works with your natural habits and, and set them up with a home for everything so that um, what they need to do then is maintain it over time. And that's where the system part comes in is organization really isn't a one and done thing. You need to set up some natural, not natural, you need to set up some habits and systems that are going to maintain that organization over time. Mm. So, so what types of systems do you put in place that will help with the you know, I'll call it decision fatigue of just all of the chaos that goes around. What systems are you putting in place that help with that? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think I love the philosophy of just deciding once about things so you don't have that decision fatigue. So a system can help you do that. So for example, with meal planning, if you have to decide every night at five o'clock what you're going to eat, you know, are we eating out? Are we eating in? What are we going to have? Like there's so many decisions that come into play. You have to do that night after night after night because you always have to eat, right? Or, you know, and multiply it by breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's a lot of decisions to make. So if you can have decide once and have a meal planning system, then that really changes the course of your week. So for example, on Sundays or the weekend, I end up making um, a meal planning list where I I have, I have already a framework in place. So Mondays for us is always a soup and a sandwich. So the soup changes, you know, and this is our winter menu. The soup will change, the sandwich will change, but I know I'm going to have a soup and a sandwich. So it takes away just starting from a blank slate of like, what are we going to have tonight? And then Tuesday is Mexican. Wednesday, we might have fish. Like I have something for every day of the week. So then it's really easy to, meal planning doesn't take me long at all. You know, I just, and I use some apps and technology that make it easier for me. So I'm not having to reinvent my grocery list every week. I'm not having to search for my recipes. Like they're all contained within an app. So I can plan out even my whole month if I wanted to in a matter of like 20, 30 minutes. It's it's really streamlined now because I have systems. Yeah, Sanger, Sanger and I have both used that. I use that, you know, one of those meal services that, you know, that they chip you the box and then you cook it at home. And that has helped so much because we don't have to go through that decision of what are we having tonight? What are we doing? What are we fixing? Where are we going? You know, and playing that game that I play with my wife, you know, where do you want to go to eat? Well, I don't care. I'll have at this place. No, not there. You know, so (laughs) just just to be I do that. I'll do that with myself sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> there's no one even I'm even talking to and it's like do I want Chipotle uh, you know and, nah, and I've, maybe been, I don't. I've been in a situation before where I've I think this happened a few months ago 
I got it. I was like, well, do I want to eat at home or do I want to go out? No. Well, I want to go out. Uh, where am I going to go? And then I played that game in my head, you know, three, four, five restaurants. I got in the car. I drove. And then as I'm driving down the street, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to Chipotle. Nah, I cha- make a decision <laughs> on a whim to drive right past that. I ended up doing a loop over the entire west side of the city, coming back home and eating stuff that was in my fridge. Oh my and I go, God. what did I even do? And this was such a waste of time. I spent 30 minutes driving around town, spending gas for no reason. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, even if you eat out, if you decide if that's on the plan, like on Wednesdays, we eat out because, you know, you're carpooling kids to sports games or whatever. It's just a, a planned decision that you already have. And and it's not like you can't vary it like you're talking about, Sanger, but it does help just to have a framework in place so that, you know, it doesn't feel so overwhelming to start the task. I think a lot of times systems, if they get too complicated, then people avoid them. And so like what you said, Sean, of having a meal delivery, that's as simple as you can make it to have dinner show up every night, right? And so you've simplified that for yourself. And now you don't even have to waste energy thinking about it. They just tell you what you're going to have, you make it and it's done. And you've saved all that mental energy that you would have otherwise, you know, caused you some frustration. I think part of what makes what you're recommending so helpful is that when we have an abundance of options, we are not actually making one choice, right? When you're deciding where to go for dinner tonight, you're not deciding, you're not making one decision. You're making maybe 10 different decisions. You're deciding is when are we going to eat dinner tonight? (laughs) Then you're deciding, do we go out or do we stay in? If you said that we're going to go out, well, then it's what type of cuisine are we going to get? What type of restaurant are we going to have a casual dining experience? Are we going to go out and sit down and have a waiter? And then you're narrowing it down and narrowing it down. So you're making a lot of category categorization choices. So the decision to say, hey, I'm going to go out to you know, Bob's Diner for dinner, it took you about five choices before you actually arrived at Bob's Diner. Yeah. And that's why there's decision fatigue, right? It's exhausting. And a lot of times that decision can fall on one person, which makes it even more exhausting because it's just one more thing added to their mental load. Um, So it really helps to just have those decisions made ahead of time. I also think when you make systems and put systems in place for yourself, it really helps you achieve whatever kind of goals you're going to set for yourself. So for example, if you want to be in shape and you want to work out and exercise, it helps to know that, you know, Monday you're going to, is going to be legs day, you know, Tuesday is going to be arms day, Wednesday is going to be stretching. Like if you, same thing, if you have a structure in place, you can still vary those activities and exercises on each of those days, but it gives you a focus and you don't have to decide. You can just show up and start exercising. And so that's going to move you closer to the goals. Whereas if you have too many decisions up front, a lot of times you don't even make it <laughs> to the gym or make it to, to exercising because there's just too many other decisions that get in the way. I think an example of this is, you know, when we look at r- reducing it, decisions the best you know becoming better at making decisions by reducing the number of decisions you have to make uh, we look at Steve Jobs and uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, even uh, Elizabeth Holmes who would wear the same things uh, we're not gonna you know, we're, every hey, day we don't almost. hold Elizabeth I, Holmes out as a <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying she's a successful <laughs> individual to <laughs> imitate she's, anymore she's known not for something good but she is known <laughs> Hitler had the same facial hair every day. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <geez. laughs> Streamlined. Focus on what mattered. Yeah, um, that's right. They're in, you know, I know people who, when they travel, they always wear the same thing when they travel on an airplane, right? I mean, that would make packing so much faster if you already always had a go to travel outfit, right? Or I think decisions like that, um, it really does simplify your life. And there's a reason that those very successful, high powered individuals have made that choice to just streamline their, their clothes. Um, I know there's, you know, a whole trend of having a very minimalist capsule wardrobe where you just reduce the number of items in your closet to maybe 30 items a season or something, and then you just wear those things. So I think those are all an attempt, like you're saying, to reduce the amount of decisions you have to make and save your mental energy for the more important decisions. How did you 
how did you learn this? Were you naturally organizing your decision making process in this way or well, I'm very indecisive. So I actually really struggle with making decisions. And so I I think that I probably came up and developed these systems just as a way to save me from from the indecision. Um, and I, I mean, I still struggle with indecision. So um, having the systems in place, especially in our household and with operating my business, it takes me out of it because now it enables other people to maintain the system. So like with our meal planning, for example, my son makes, you know, pasta every Sunday night. Because we have that every night, he, or every week, he knows how to make it and he's taken that over. Um, And then sometimes we have Brenner on Wednesday nights. My husband takes that over. And then my goal is to get my other two kids specializing in a meal so I can just work my way out of making dinner. I'm sorry, what did you say? Did you say Brenner? No. Brenner, it's like breakfast for dinner. You have Brenner. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like a, a a surefire cure for insomnia. Like carb load at 9 p.m. <laughs> Pancakes, baby. Yeah, now go pancakes to bed. Pancakes are really easy when on those nights where you need something for dinner, you know, and that way, if you call it Brenner, it sounds like something special, you know, it's yeah. it's a game changer. OK, so how are you doing this for your business? Uh, our business on the back end has a lot of systems. And that was really the only way we could scale our business mm-hmm. is by putting systems in place. But when it was just me doing everything, I didn't need as many systems because I was in control of the whole operation. But I found when I started hiring individuals, I needed to for them to understood what I did. And we needed to kind of standardize it so that things were done in the same way um, at the same time. And so I really started documenting all of the things I did and finding patterns. And then those became our systems. And it allows me, I mean, I, I could scale as much as I want right now because we've got such solid systems in place. It's hard when you're building a business because to, because you're so busy to develop those systems, but they're really the key to enabling a business owner to scale. Um, so that now I I don't organize on a day to day basis, but I've got amazing team members who do, and we have such strong systems that we're able to train new employees and absorb more people in, help more people ultimately because we have um, some some good back end business systems. Yeah. The struggle there, I think, is a lot of people who are business, start businesses are not naturally good at creating systems. You're, you're a rarity as someone who started a business and is also naturally talented at, at system creation. But part of that, part of what causes someone to start a business is they're, they're freewheeling. They're, they're, they're going to go chart their own territory and, and they don't want to be boxed in. <laughs> then they're out on an island with no systems and no, no parameters. How are you getting people on board with the systems um, that you are creating within your own company? So I would say for business, um, I think we've when you live without systems, you know what it feels like, right? Whether it's your yeah. family life or in business, you can see where things are breaking down. And that's generally a sign where you need a system. Like if things are frustrating, there's a lot of friction, if um, things are getting dropped or not taken care of, or you have unhappy clients or customers, you know, any step in the process where it feels clunky and you know, it's not going well. To me, that's a good sign of like, all right, you need a system in place for that. And so that's kind of how it started for us is, you know, the contract process for us of just onboarding a new client felt very clunky. We had to send it and they had to print it out and sign it and send it back. And then like all the step paying the deposit, all of that. And we're working with people who maybe aren't naturally organized. So it's even harder. (laughs) It's a bad problem to have with your client base. Yeah. One of the first things we did was implement a CRM that just automated everything. So when we would send, we developed a workflow and um, we use a system called Dubsado and we would send our client the email and then they would read through the information of the estimate. They would 
click next and then they'd sign the contract. They'd click next, they'd pay the deposit and then click next, they'd get scheduled and it's done. And then automatic reminders get sent to them. Like we didn't have to do anything except start them on the workflow. And, you know, it takes a lot of time initially to set up systems like that, but it saves you hours and hours. I mean, I would used to have to remember to send the reminders for each session. Now it's all automated and you can personalize everything everything. So it's not impersonal, but it's efficient and, um, and it's reliable. You know, I don't have to count on my memory now. I can count on our system to work. I have a reliable system. And I think when you have a reliable system, you don't have to hold on and worry anymore because you trust your system to work. Mm. So when, when we look at avoiding decision fatigue, I would think one of the things is around how you manage time. Do you look at that and say, how can I manage my time more effectively to avoid de- decision fatigue? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think um, for me, when I was starting my business, my schedule was all over the place. And so it's hard to be very productive when you have constant interruptions. And so I'm a believer in batching things together and consolidating similar activities into, you know, a set amount of time. And so I started blocking off two days a week on my calendar. And that's when I do all of my consultations. And then I blocked off um, one day for working on projects so that I could be uninterrupted and be able to really dive into something and stay into it. And that's kind of the day where I'm doing content creation and writing blog posts and thinking about kind of higher level things for my business. And then I have a day where I carve out for networking. And, you know, so I structured my week in a way that I can be fully present for each thing and I'm not pulled in a million directions. And I think that helps with the decision fatigue um, because you're staying focused on one thing. And so you end up being more productive in the long run. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of stuff by uh, Dan Sullivan through Strategic Coach. And one of the things he talks about is having Focus days, buffer days, and free days. Focus days are the days where you, you're you executing on your unique ability, the thing that you're doing the best, and then your buffer days are helping you to prepare for those uh, focus days that you need, the things you can't delegate. So focus days, you've delegated away everything except what is your unique ability. Buffer days are the things you can't delegate away, but you have to support. And then the free day is a 24-hour day where you are renewing and refreshing. So you're not doing, you're not at work. And so I adopted that years ago in terms of sort of time blocking, what kind of what you're talking about. And it really helped me in deciding, all right, here's what I'm doing today. I'm loading up my day with the things that I need to be doing just back to back so that I couldn't, I forced myself to not deviate. So I kind of decided once, as you were saying, and then those buffer days, I knew all I had to do that day was was figure out how to support the, f- the focus days. So I would be meeting with staff, I would be answering emails, I'd be doing compliance issues, uh, preparing for presentations. And then I was able to, in those free days, just totally disengage. I would, uh, I would tell my assistant, I'm, I'm going to go dark. I'm not checking emails. I'm not calling the office. I am away. I'm not even bringing work-related literature to to read. And it was super helpful for me in terms of time blocking and making that decision. I guess that was a system, kind of like yeah, what you were talking exactly, about. <laughs> right? And in, I think doing it consistently over time, um, like you said, you wouldn't have to worry then on your off days that something wouldn't get done because you knew come your focus day, you would deal with it. And so you had a reliable, trustworthy system um, so that you knew when your work would get done. Whereas if you don't have a system in place, you know, your mind's going crazy with just thinking of all of the things that you have to do and all of the decisions you still have to make. And you have no plan in place for when you're going to make those decisions. So it can be really stressful. And I love David Allen and getting things done. And I think he is 
really great about talking, like doing a brain dump to get everything out of your head. Um, And then he has a weekly review that he suggests doing once a week to go through your calendar and upcoming events, to go through everything in your inbox, to go like, it's just basically clearing your head and getting straight on everything that is currently on your plate. So in our home, we have kind of a weekly reset where we do a lot of those things. So once a week on Sunday, we're doing a calendar sync with my husband and I and our kids where we all get out our calendars and we look at the upcoming week and see what's ahead. And that really helps because if you see there's a birthday party coming up next Saturday, that means you have to get a gift for it. You have to, there's a lot of the, like maybe with sports practices, there's a conflict you need to arrange for rides. So you're like thinking of all those things in advance. So then you're not scrambling in the moment um, because you're prepared. And then we also do household things where we do all of our laundry on the same day and our kids doing their own laundry now that's like a whole system for them and um we we get that done we do the meal planning like we just kind of knock it all out in a in a couple hour period so that we have a reset on our week and we know like we only open our mail once a week and so it's fine if it piles up all week long because we have a system we can trust we know that once a week we'll go through it all and distribute it take action on it and we're not having to worry about it because we know we'll get to it you know, once you're only opening your mail once a week. Yeah, you know, we pay all of our bills oh, wow. online. We'll we'll just kind of glance at it to see if there's anything urgent. Which nowadays, really, there never is. There never is, right? Yeah, and hardly. so it you can could, just you could open yeah. it once and never. And it'd probably be fine. <laughs> Yeah, that's what we find with a lot of our clients is they know they stop opening their mail because they know all the important stuff is online, and then it you know, gathers up and it, there's a lot of clutter related to mail. So if you don't have a system or like a paper flow in your house, then it, mail clutter, paper clutter is a really big problem for a lot of our clients. I feel bad for our mail guy, <laughs> or for our post, our postman. Like he walks up here every day, you know, in the rain, sleet or snow to bring stuff that goes right in the trash. Right. You know, it's just like, oh, geez. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things is a lot of times we encourage our clients to stop it before it gets into your house. So, you know, the first thing would be going paperless and you can do like unscribe me and there's some certain um, unroll me. I mean, that you can unsubscribe to all of those catalogs that get sent to you. you what? Know, you can, yeah, you can go on there and can check it all off. And then they stop, they send it out and they stop all of those catalogs from coming in. So that's one thing you can do before it even gets to your house. Wait, what is yeah, the, what is, is there this, a website for that? So um, Unroll Me, um, I think it's unroll.me, I think. Um, and then... Yeah. I'll send you so you can put in your show notes the the ones I'd recommend. Um, but yeah, it's just, and it's really easy because it's a one-stop shop. They take care of it for you. Um, one, you can do it with your emails as well and then subscribe. And then you can also do it with catalogs. So that's one thing. The other thing is- I can do it with the emails? Yeah. yeah and they'll okay, do it. Okay, but see this, this one, I, I, I don't trust it 100% because what if I miss something that- Actually, isn't more. What if it sweeps? See, that's how they get you. Yeah, well, that's how sweeps they get that you. one thing that I really did need to know. One thing you could do with that is just do an email filter, like a Google filter, so that anything with the word unsubscribe, or if it's a, you know, if it's something like I like J. Crew. So if I have a filter set up that all of J. Crew um, emails get filtered and put into a separate folder. And that way, if I want to buy something from J. Crew, I can always go there and see if there's any coupons from the latest sales, but it's not cluttering up my inbox. It goes Wait, automatically. Did you, did you just say you, you, you sort your email? emails by unsubscribe it finds the word unsubscribe and puts them into a certain yep Yep. oh that's brilliant and some of them maybe you want because maybe you are on people's email list that you know have the word unsubscribe (laughs) i only want i only want the email sent to me by somebody who's sending me an email right like you know like you're sending me an email those are the only ones i want i don't want any of this other stuff yeah or have a separate email account right for all of that stuff that maybe you do want but you just keep it out of your inbox um 
that's another approach. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can organize your email to be a little bit more efficient. So you're just seeing the important stuff, but all that clutter, it, it, it makes you avoid wanting to get into your email, right. Or dealing with your paper because there's so much of it. And so even before walking into the house with your mail, just stand by the recycling bin and toss half of it so that you're only bringing into your house. You know, you're not bringing in all the advertisements. You're just bringing in the one or two pieces of mail that are may actually be important. So it's the same way with clutter. I mean, just don't buy as much, right? Like what you were saying, saying, or is just not buying, not having as much stuff, getting rid of stuff on a regular basis and not purchasing, being a little more intentional with your purchases um, so that you don't have so much clutter, how much, as much things that you need to organize or come up with systems for. Yeah. That is the key for me is getting rid of stuff that I don't need. And do you do that on a regular basis or kind of once in a while? I do it twice a year with clothes. So I like put all of my clothes in. I have two racks and I kind of subdivide them by type of, by occasion, sort Mm -hmm. of, right? Uh, So I have like coats, t-shirts or, you know, non-coat shirts Mm -hmm. and then like professional shirts. And what I do is I organize, anytime I pull one off of a hanger, I put it back on the right hand side of the, of that. That's smart. Old segment. That's a system. And so then, it, you know, in January, I'll go in and I look at everything that's on the left. And in July, I look at everything that's on the left and I go, did I actually wear this? <laughs> when did I really see myself wearing this? And a lot of times the answer is no, but, but it's really cool looking. Yeah. That, that's a smart system. Another approach that's very similar to that is instead of placing the hanger the way you usually do on a hanger, you reverse it so that the hook is the opposite way. And then at the end of a season, you can, well, start them off that way. And then anything you wear gets put back on the regular way. So you can see at the end of a season what you've worn and what you haven't worn. And I typically do that just to, because you're right, like after each season, things change and that's a nice natural break to, or an opportunity to go through and just get rid of things. Another system I have in my closet is the number of hangers I have. I only limit myself to a certain number of hangers and I don't ever let myself buy more so that if I go shopping and I run out of hangers, then I'm forced to get rid of some things Mm. in order to make the new things fit. Are Um, people buying hangers? uh, Do people buy hangers? I guess. (laughs) What do you mean? Do people buy hangers? I, I I just have them. Like, they, like from I, the they, they gr- my hanger collection grows. You know, I take something to the dry cleaner. They give me a hanger for free. Oh, that's funny. Well, we like using um, like all matching hangers is one thing that really can change the the look of your closet. It's a very simple thing, but changing them to all the same, it reduces that visual clutter with all the mismatched and different color plastic hangers. And, you know, I mean, if you're always doing um, dry cleaning, we suggest just using, putting, keeping those things on your dry cleaning, um, on those hangers that they give you, but everything else, swapping it out to all the same color matching hangers makes a huge difference in how your closet looks. And that that's purely aesthetic, not, yes. Yes. not a, um... well, I, I think there's a lot to be said about mental clutter and, and, and in decision-making mental clutter has got to be, uh, you know, a negative factor in terms of quality decision making. Yeah, think. that's right. Just having some like open space on your shelves, um, you know, just having, giving your eye a break from that busyness when it's all uniform. It really, I don't know, there's something about it just that allows you to take exhale. <laughs> you know, it feels mm. good when there is simplicity in your surroundings. Um, and I think it makes a difference when you're for your productivity and your your mental ability to kind of shut off your environment and focus on what's important. But if you're surrounded by chaos, um, it's really hard to concentrate and focus. I think that's why when people like go in school, when you're supposed to be studying or writing a paper in college, like you instead end up organizing your desk, right? Or like cleaning. It's because I think getting things in order then allows your brain to shut off and um, focus on what you need to focus. Having a clear surface really helps with that. Oh, for sure. For sure. um, Whenever I'm writing or working on a project that 
requires me to spend time alone without talking to anyone or collaborating. I always found that I would spend an hour to maybe two hours going through emails, uh, finishing up notes from other Mm. meetings, doing whatever, you know, Um, mostly administrative type work, not, you know, I'm not working on some other bigger, more important project. I'm working on the, the little stuff that I was kind of just lingering in the back of my mind. And so now once I realize that, instead of fighting it and say, no, just focus, just write. Mm -hmm. I I just kind of accepted it and said, well, if I'm going to write, I'm going to have to have a, you know, hour and a half buffer ahead of time. Um, So if I'm going to write for an hour and a half, that means I'm scheduling three hours because otherwise if I schedule an hour and a half, I'm not going to get anything done. The great thing that you just are talking about is that you know yourself well enough now so that you're not fighting that process that you need before you get to writing. Um, but you acknowledge that this is how I'm wired. This is how it works. And I think when you are honest with yourself and you understand how you operate, then you can set up systems because there's not one system that's going to work for everyone. You set up a system that works for you and your natural habits. And for me, I'm very forgetful, very forgetful. It's why I'm so organized in the first place, I think. And so I never trust myself that I'm going to remember anything. It's always written down. I have checklists for things. You know, I make to-do lists because I know myself well enough to, to know I'm not going to remember. And so I think, um, setting up systems that work with your strengths and your weaknesses can really help you in your life. But first step is being honest with who you are and how you operate. How do you do that? It's really easy to make excuses or it's really easy to say, um, oh, you know, I'm just, I just can't do, I'm just not wired to do this task that happens to be really inconvenient and not fun and unfulfilling. And then Mm -hmm. throw up our hands and say that, oh, that's just, that's just not for me. Yeah. Well, it's also what you value. I mean, some things, maybe it's not for you and you just let it go. But if it's something that's important to you and that you do value and that you do want to have, there's an outcome that you do want, then you do need to put systems in place that work with your natural habits. So for me, for example, I... I am not motivated on my own to exercise. And I know that about myself and because I keep trying and failing and I'm not getting the outcome. And so I know for me, I need to add accountability and have a structure in place. And so, you know, I have, um, I have a personal trainer. And so I know that if it was up to me, I'd let myself down and not show up. But because I have to go and show up there with her, I'm not going to like stand her up and and not show up. I, I get myself there. And so for me, I knew I needed that accountability in order to, to get to my outcome. I think, you know, if you know yourself and it is important, you do have a goal, then you need some systems and processes in place. And I love the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. Have you guys ever read that one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good. You know, he talks a lot about habits and systems and that instead of focusing on the goal, focus on your system. And one of my favorite quotes from from his book is, you don't rise the, to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And I really think focusing on um, just your systems will then, you'll end up at your goal, but those ongoing consistent processes that you build into your life, they're going to be what takes you, you know, to your goal instead of only focusing on your goal. You really need those steps to get there with systems. When you look at decision fatigue, avoiding decision fatigue, because uh, I want to go back to that because that's uh, that's the thing I'm really interested in is, is when we look at that, you talked about deciding once, which I think is brilliant, talking about having a system, any other things that you would suggest to avoid decision fatigue? Well, I think making your systems visible and making them easy. Like if you have overly complicated systems, they're going to fail. Like it's just too hard. And then you need some kind of visible cue to do them. 
I mean, and nowadays with technology, it's so easy to set reminders, you know, on Alexa or on your phone to have recurring reminders for yourself, um, utilizing technology um, in that way. But some kind of visual cue to remind you to do it because it's hard to create new habits and systems. And so I think if you put some kind of simple things in place and make them visible, that can really help you implement it. It also makes it easier on other people in your life. So give, give me an example of that and making it visible. What do you yeah, mean? Yeah. So for, for us, we have um, morning and afternoon checklists when my kids were younger that we used. And so all of the things that they needed to do in their morning routine um, was written down in a checklist. And the same is true for our weekly reset. I have a checklist of all the items. And so, and that's in a visible place for us. We have a, so every morning they would go through their checklist. I didn't have to nag them all the time because it was all written down, you know, eating breakfast, remembering your water bottle, your PE clothes, your library book, whatever it is, that was all on a checklist. And they would we, they would check that off. And I would just say, did you do your checklist? And so I didn't have to keep all the things in my head that they needed to remember. It was their responsibility and they followed their checklist. And in the same way, like um, making it visible, when we do our calendar sync and our meal planning, I have a really big um, chalkboard weekly calendar that lives in a very visible place in our home. We pass it every day, we see it. And so we write that every single week with the new calendar of, you know, whether we have orthodontist appointments or a business meeting or whatever, it all goes on that calendar. We write our meals up there. And I've gotten in the habit and the routine of, you know, wiping that down every week and filling filling it in. So it's a very visible reminder for us of what our schedule is and what we have to do and what our meals are going to be. And the kids don't even ask what's for dinner. They just can look and they see. Um, so it puts us all in the same plan. So I think that also helps. So whether it's um, a reminder, we have a, a sticky note on our washing machine that says set a timer, you know, as a re- reminder when my kids are learning to do their laundry, it was like, oh yeah, like you put in your laundry, set a timer. And just having that visual cue to remind them helps. Uh, I, why don't I do that? <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's wet laundry sitting in my washer right now that's been there since Sunday. But make it easy, that's right? Great. Like either I do that every yeah. week. I, I'll throw something in there that I'm like, it, usually it's the last load. I'm like, okay, yeah, done. I'm not. Oh, yeah. I'm still gonna You're wait. not alone yeah. with that. I mean, yeah. I I'm like that myself because you think, oh, I'll remember. But you, that's being honest with yourself, right? I, I'm not taking any of the bullshit judgment from you, Sean. <laughs> you don't do your own laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I can still criticize. No, that. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> do you yeah. see it with the side eye? Like I'm just uh, such a failure for doing. No, that. that is such a common problem, and I think it's why. Why laundry becomes such a chore because it goes on and on and on because you do forget about it. And so not thinking that you're going to remember and making it easy. So if you don't always have your phone on you, keep a timer right there. We have a magnetic timer that lives right next to the washing machine. And it's, I bought one that has two timers for the um, washing machine and for the dryer. And so my kids can set that and then take it with them. And the rule is when the timer goes off, if you can't get to it right now, you have to reset it because, you know, it's easy to just put off and then you've then you're back in the same boat. So, you know, but developing those habits are really um, helpful and just making it visible and making it easy to do. I mean, if you've got like, you know, one of Google voice or whatever, I mean, you can just say set a timer for 20 minutes and then that you can use that technology. You can use your phone, whatever works for you, but just make it easy to always set a timer. That's really smart. What that's, that's something that is obvious and clear. What is something that you've implemented with success that sounds like it should not work? Oh, wow. That's a hard question. Say, say a little bit more about that. Set the timer and then you'll remember, right? That, that is really, and, and remind yourself with the note. That seems like nobody could object to that. Even without trying it, I hear you talk about it. I go, well, that is definitely going to work. There's got to be something that you do for your clients that everyone goes, Come on, Susie, that's not going to work. <laughs> oh, and that, and that it and does, it does though. Yeah. Um, 
That's a good question. I I do think we do get a lot of skeptics kind of like, ah, I don't think that's going to work. One of them is, you know, we hear complaints about people like always leaving things on kitchen islands, right? And they get piled up with stuff. And I'm a big believer that you can't change people. And so, or it's hard to change uh other people. And so if they have their natural habit of always putting their key on the kitchen island or, or their wallet or whatever, like just put a tray there, you know, just put a tray, give it a place, a specific place in around the same place they leave it. And just that becomes the new home. But it, it somehow makes a huge difference because then it has a little bit more of a purpose of like, Oh, now this is where I put my Mm. my keys and my wallet. And it doesn't then creep out to the whole island and the island starts piling up, up, up with other things. Like when you give things a specific home, it seems silly to micro sort some things. Like when we do a junk drawer, you know, we're giving batteries their own place and labeling it and rubber bands and people like, oh, we don't need labels. It's like, well, if you want to maintain it over time, you do. You need that visual cue that, oh yeah, that's where the rubber bands go. Oh yeah, that's where my keys go. Um, because over time, and there's so many people coming in and out of your house, then pretty quickly that junk drawer is back to being a junk drawer because you've all forgotten where the designated zones for things are. So Mm. adding labels really does make a difference, even if you're the only one living there. It's like a visual cue that reminds you where things belong. And it really does make a difference. So we have a lot of people who are kind of doubters about that, but I think it works because when we go back a year later, it's still looking good. And when we don't have labels, it doesn't. That makes sense. Well, now I'm I'm sitting there listening to you, thinking of all the labels that I need to put <laughs> in my house and all the junk drawers I have. Um, I learned a lot. I I um, I also did hear you say, Sanger is right, Sean is wrong. Throw stuff out immediately <laughs> when you want to get rid well, of. Well, we will never force people to get rid of things. Uh, we are not minimalists, but we are intentionalists. So just be intentional about what you have. Make sure what you do have in your home is something you want, you need, you love. Um, and just as long as you feel that way about your things, then you can have a. Yeah, we we are going through that process right now. My wife has these four other friends, and they decided they were all going to go to each other's house oh, houses such a good idea. over the course. And so all of these women were in my closet. I came up the other day, and there were five ladies in my closet, and they were just going through all my wife's stuff, and just and it was, I guess, super helpful for her because they were like, "Nah, don't you know? That's not cute. That's not what yeah. you know. Don't wear that. You know." And So that was good. It cleared it out. But now she has this big project of what to do with all this stuff in in, in bags. But it's easier to get rid of. Take to Goodwill or the secondhand store or whatever she's doing with all this stuff. She's created a a real mess. uh, We're right in the middle of it. That's a good idea, though, because it's easier to get rid of other people's things, right? Like, oh, I guess it was because all these ladies were like, yeah, get rid of it, lose it. Yeah. So. Yeah, they're just going around all the other houses. So it's that's awesome. What a good idea, them, right? Guess. And that accountability <laughs> that works because there's accountability. It's like they they don't have emotional attachments to to your stuff. No, that's why it's easier for no. us to come in and organize someone's home, um, and we leave feeling fine. They're exhausted because they've made a million decisions, you know. Whereas you don't have to make those decisions; it's really for them. So, getting organized and decluttering is fairly exhausting because of all the decisions you have to make, and there's a lot of emotional decisions because, um, you know, you you have emotions with stuff, and so mm-hmm. it can be a hard process. But it feels really good once it's done because you are thinking more intentionally about what you're keeping and that that feels good to kind of clear away the unimportant and keep the good stuff well we did it today susie and now (laughs) i'm going to be more organized i'm going to go home (laughs) right after this and feverishly throw out a bunch of things and 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 go get a label maker on the way home too um where can people find you and connect with your work 
So we really live on Instagram. That's our jam. Um, We have a lot of inspirational before and after pictures from our clients' homes. We also like to give a lot of organization tips. Um, Signing up for our newsletter is a big one. Um, Our newsletter that came out today is actually all on meal planning apps and which one, uh, different, a description about each one and, and how they work. And so we have a lot of great content on our website as well. But I would say Instagram and our newsletter are probably the best best places to connect with us. Awesome. Thanks so much, Susie. Thanks for having having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Well, that was a fun discussion with Susie. My takeaway from our our talk with her is when it comes to decision-making, I will be best if I can just decide once. So decide what is my meal plan going to be? Decide what, you know, I'm going to hire a trainer for working out. Decide these are the clothes I'm going to wear to work, uh, you know, khaki pants, blue shirt, you know, whatever it is. Make fewer decisions so I can be a better decision maker by making fewer decisions and deciding once. That was my takeaway. My takeaway more broadly is remind yourself of the things that are important or remind yourself of the things that you need to do. So Susie talked about the note on the uh, dishwasher, the note on the clothes washer um, to set a timer. So set a timer so that you'll come back. So a reminder to set a timer and then the timer exists as a reminder to take the clothes or the dishes out of the machine. She also talked about um, visual cues that remind you to follow the systems that you create, whether that's trays or containers or um putting little labels on different cabinets and what their purpose is for reminding yourself of what is important is key because the likelihood that you will remember all of the things that are important to you is zero. You simply will not remember the things that are truly important to you. You won't remember the systems that you create. You won't remember the values at all times in all moments. So what are the things that are really important to us? Well, my core values are important to me. Well, um, how I operate in this system um, is important to me. My company's mission is important to me. Um, where the pots and pans go in my house is important to remember. All of those things are important. Some are more important. Some are less important. Some are very big ideas. Some are simple. You still need to remember them, which means you need to remind yourself of them. You just made a great decision to listen to this episode of Decidedly. Make another great decision and leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support. It helps others find our community and defeat bad decision-making in their own lives. For more daily decision-making insights, check us out at decidedlypodcast.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. Thanks again for listening. I'm Sanger Smith, and this is Decidedly. Insights, advice, and comments provided by Sean Smith, Sanger Smith, and speakers identified as part of the Decidedly Podcast should not be considered recommendations. Speakers not identified as members of Decidedly are expressing their opinion, and their statements should not be construed as reflecting the views of the Decidedly team. This podcast is produced solely for informational purposes, not personalized advice.